Hi, hi everybody. Yeah, so thanks Michael for introducing me. So today my topic will be on uh, a day in the life of a QE. Okay, but technically I'm not going to go through my day. Lah. I'm just going to talk about some tools and some things that I do. So, okay, let's start. So today I'll be talking about uh, these things, which is uh, my role as a QE the different types of testing, the different testing frameworks, and then I'll go through some tools that I use uh, for automated testing. Okay, so the first one. So I'm not sure how many of you have experienced uh, as a QE or with testing. Um, so I'll just summarize. So basically what a QE does, right, in the name quality engineer, we try to ensure the quality of the product. Okay, so there are some different ways to do that. For example, test, test plans and test scenarios, we'll, we'll design them, uh, create automated test scripts, uh, performance and security testing, exploratory and manual testing. So that one is, for example, trying to find bugs in the system, trying to find out things that break the system, uh, monitoring and automation pipeline. So for example, every morning I, we push code, developers push code, they will run against all the tests that the testers have written to make sure that nothing breaks. Yes. And then last one is release and deployment support. So yeah, when you deploy code, we need verification. When you deploy code, you need tests, yeah, stuff like that. So that's generally uh, what a QE does. So for uh, all of you guys, I know you're quite familiar with what one's is like uh, so as a product backlog it takes stories then you take the stories into your sprint and then you plan you implement and there's review and retro so when can a QA actually be involved in this whole process yeah one might think that maybe it's just after implementation and then we test right so uh, obviously the answer is not just there lah. that's why I'm, I'm putting up this this infographic so the idea is that actually a QE can be involved all the way at the start. So these are just some stages inside a sprint, uh, not limited to this. So for example, during backlog refinement, a QE can actually include testing efforts in the backlog item estimation. So we can decide how much time is spent on this item, how many things that we need to test, etc. And then in the next step, in sprint planning, we can come up with test scenarios together with the devs to decide what is required for this story based on the AC. AC is acceptance criteria. Then during development, we can actually write the automated tests concurrently with development. So you might think that you need to finish the, the dev code first and then we test. But actually, uh, with some of the tools later that I'll go through, we can do it concurrently. Then this way, it's kind of like test-driven development, which I will talk a little, little bit about later. And after development, we can start doing more exploratory testing. So instead of testing what the developers develop based on requirements, we can actually save some time because we were we are testing during their development and instead we can do more edge case testing after that. So this is just some ways that we can be involved during a sprint. So next I will go through a bit about the different types of testing. So I'm sure you guys have seen this pyramid before. So this is the testing automation pyramid. So how this pyramid is designed is that uh, at the bottom, you can see we need a lot of these tests. So unit tests are the tests that you should write the most of, and it should also test the small components. Um, then as you go up, you should write less of these tests because it costs more to test them and it takes more time. But it tests more things. So unit tests only test like your function, how your function is supposed to do. Integration test is how this test interacts with, how your feature interacts with external components, such as external APIs, database, web services, etc. And then end-to-end -end test, you use a test environment to check that all your tests, are, all your features are running correctly. So this is just the different types of testing. Uh, another way to visualize it is also through this testing quadrant. So you can see there's like a scale like this and like this. So business facing means like uh, what the users want to see. Uh, like uh, if I want to design an app to, to transfer money, then they must be able to transfer money. 
Then technology facing is like performance. So if I'm going to design an app to transfer money, how fast can the money be transferred? And Okay, this is just an example. So this on this scale, you can see the different types of testing. And it's not that one quadrant is more important than the other. It's just that it helps us visualize the different tests we need to make one feature. Yeah, so, okay, this is just a visualization tool. Okay, then next we will talk a bit also about the different frameworks. So on top of these tests, we can actually uh, have another layer. So for example, behavior-driven development. So just now we were talking about business requirements. So tests can be written such that we uh, explain what the business owners or product owners want the product to do. So, it, so for example, I want, the, I want to transfer money. So then I write the test in a way that I literally say, hey, I want to transfer money. And the test has to do exactly that thing. So it helps the developers focus on what's requested, uh, helps uh, document the things that the app's supposed to do also. The another framework is also test driven development uh, that you guys are more familiar with where you write the test first and then you develop i mean you write a failing test first and then you develop until the test passes then you refactor then you run another test and you develop yeah so this the cycle is here like you can see you write you pass the refactor so the thing that i wanted to raise here is that it's not just limited to unit tests i know developers are more uh, familiar with writing unit tests first, but actually automated tests, we can also write a failing one first before it passes. So one example could be, for example, I want to click this button to go to the next page. Then you can actually automate the this clicking process. Well, first it's going to fail because the button is not there. Lah, but after you call the button, then it'll pass and then it'll move to the next page. And, and then you can contest. So that's the same idea. Yeah. So, after we go through these things, uh, we can go and talk about the tools. So, some of the tools that we use for automated testing are here. Uh, I will talk to you about each, each one of them. So, first one is Selenium. It's, it's a browser automation tool. Um, it executes remote commands uh, across the network. And the Selenium suite consists of these three things. The IDE, so it helps you record and play. Then there's the Selenium grid that allows uh, the, the, thing, the test to run on different browsers and different OS. So you can run in parallel in like Chrome, Firefox, Edge. And it has like a hub and several nodes, so you can run it in parallel. And the last one is Selenium WebDriver. So I'll explain a bit about how Selenium WebDriver works. So Selenium WebDriver architecture is like this. So we have our Java code that is uh, uh, written. To, to for our test scripts, then the Java code will actually uh, because the code cannot communicate with the client, the, the browser directly. So what happens is Selenium actually uses this JSON wire protocol to transfer data from here to here. So if the code is like, hey, click this button, then the protocol will have a endpoint to call, then they will click the button. So it's like boom boom. Yeah. Then so the idea is like, uh, it's a bit slower because you have to go through this thing and it's accessing from a remote place instead of accessing the browser itself. But this is the general idea. So after using this, there's some pros and cons that I've, I've come up with. I guess you can also ask ChatGPT. You don't just have to ask me. Then the, the idea is that the Selenium is open source. You can write it in any, pretty much any scripting language. Uh, I write it in Java, la, so anything can can be done. And then you support different browsers. You can do parallel testing with it also. And it's also compatible with different OS. But the thing about Selenium is that setting up the framework takes a lot of time. And you can't actually use it for testing. Yeah, and also we need third-party libraries for other features. Like if you want reports, you need to like install stuff. Okay, so that's Selenium. Then we'll move on to Apium. So Apium, Apium, okay, I don't know how to pronounce it, but yeah, so it's actually the same thing, but mobile apps. So Selenium, I mentioned just now that you cannot use it for mobile apps. And that's because the protocol doesn't allow us to access 
those extra API methods that ABM created for the mobile apps. Yeah, so this is just like an add-on. And the benefits of this is that on top of Selenium is that you can do mobile app testing. Okay, then the next one is Catalon. So, okay, there's a screenshot later, but Catalon in general is, is a low-code browser automated testing uh, framework. So it's like a it's like a studio you can okay I'll just show you actually lol source. Okay so as you can see right it's a it's it's a UI kind of thing. Then you can actually record test cases and like access all the code that you want from here. It's more for those people that do not really want to learn how to code then you can use this. Yeah. But there's also a scripting function. So if you really super duper want to use this and you really super duper want to code also, then I guess you can uh, you can script in Groovy, but they only uh, support one language. So the benefit of this is that uh, it's, it's low code, user friendly. Uh, it has an intuitive dashboard. So it has built in reports. You can just like generate reports from the UI also. And it also has integrated CI CD. But the bad thing is also that it can only be done, scripting can only be done in Groovy and it's not open source. So you can't pay. La. So if you if you reach or so then you know. Okay, I'm kidding. So so lastly, because how Catalan works is that it actually has it is actually on top of Selenium web driver. So Selenium WebDriver is already a bit slower because it's it's remote and it accesses the browser through the protocol. So this one is like one more layer on top of that. So it's definitely a little bit more slow compared to Selenium. Okay, then I'll go through this one, Cypress. So Cypress is JavaScript based. So just now uh, we are talking about Java, like Selenium, and we're talking about a studio that you can just click, click, click. And now Cypress is only JavaScript based. So what it does is that it manipulates the browser directly using, so it basically it runs in the same loop as your application. So you don't need to access the browser remotely. It just runs in your browser. So because of that, right, it's actually a lot faster. So the, where Selenium, right, we're running from a remote place into the, to the browser. So one of the benefits is that Cypress is easy to set up. Uh, if you are using Node to develop your apps, then it's just running in the same loop. And okay, I don't know if you are familiar with Selenium, but sometimes for Selenium, if you try to click on stuff, click on them, you can't click on them because you need to wait for the element to show up first before you click on them. So there's problems like this, but for Cypress, there's already inbuilt weights for you so then you don't have to automatically i mean you don't have to code the weights yourself so it's just a lot more convenient but the bad thing about cypress is that uh, if you want to do tests in multiple browsers it's not possible so if you want to like open one browser click 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 and then you close you can't do that and if you want to run tests in parallel you also can't do that unless you download certain plugins yeah and lastly if uh, you're very good at JavaScript, then good for you. But if not, then this this one only supports JavaScript or TypeScript. Okay, then lastly, uh, I'll talk a bit about Playwright, but I personally haven't used it myself. So it's up and coming. Um, it's a new uh, library. It uses browser, li browser library to access the browser. Um, so it's actually also within the browser help within the browser itself, so it's faster than Selenium. Um, but it's up and coming, so the community is not as wide and there's not as much help as the rest, but there's still help, lah. yeah. So, you know what, in life, right? <laughs> okay, so, yeah, so it's a good tool for us to try, yeah. Then one of the benefits of Playwright is that um, they can take, automatic snapshots at each point in the testing run. So as a test run, you can actually see what the browser looks like at that instant and then inspect the browser. So that's something that's cool about it. I personally haven't tried it, so I cannot really say uh, my experience using it. Yeah, so um, 
Now we are just I'm just listing some tools, but previously I mentioned behavior driven development. So there's actually another tool also that can help with it. Okay, so I'll talk a bit about cucumber. So how cucumber works is that it can integrate with any of these uh things that tools that I mentioned below. So you can actually have cucumber together with selenium or cucumber with cypress or cucumber with catalon. It's just how you put them together. And how cucumber works is that it helps support behavior-driven development. So it reads executable specifications in English and then it runs code base. So let me show you uh, some of an example of this. So we write written text based on user requirements and it's written in Gherkin. So Gherkin is a language that, that supports like given, when, then. And then each step is mapped to a function. And then after that, after you run your test, you can also see the reports. So here's one example. So for example, okay, so the left side, okay, the left side of your left side, my right side, your left side is the Gherkin language. So this is the, the step we have given today is Sunday. Then on your right side, you can see the function. So I will, for example, set a variable to be Sunday. Then let's say I have another line say, when I ask whether it's Friday yet, so then you will map literally a sentence to the function. Oh yeah, okay, it is Friday. And then the then sentence will be an assertion. So what do I expect this test case to do? Then I'll map it to, yeah, I said that it is gonna tell me no, no or yes, uh, based on whether it's Friday or not. So this is just a general gist of what Cucumber does and how, how it works. Yeah, so some of the benefits of Cucumber is that we can express our requirements in human readable form. So instead of writing testing code like, a click this, click that, you can, you can tell in English what we're supposed to do. It helps with usability because let's say I keep needing to log in. I log in, log in, log in. I don't have to keep coding login. I can just write the English word I, I need to log in like a few times. But the bad thing is that because it's written in English, I mean, it's kind of redundant sometimes. If I want to write too many things like, and a user clicks this and does this and does this, it's not as efficient as writing code. Yeah, so here yeah, are some, just some pros and cons. So ultimately, um, a testing tool, there are many different testing tools and there's many things you can choose from. But ultimately, a testing tool should be decided based on your project requirement, your team's technical competencies. So for example, what language are you more comfortable with? Whether you want to code or you want to code. And you have to determine which of these pros are more important to you. So based on what you value, you can therefore choose the testing tool. Yeah, so in summary, this is what I plan to go through. So in summary, a QE's role, you can actually start as early as backlog refinement in the sprint. For the different types of testing, you, you can't just focus on one test. You can't just do unit tests and then like, oh yeah, I'm going to do like 25,000 unit tests and my app is going to be successful. But the idea is you need different types of tests. Then for your testing framework, you it's another layer. So you need to decide. You can actually have multiple testing frameworks together, but you can decide based on your requirements, what you need. And lastly, for your tools, it should be chosen based on what you need. And what you're more comfortable with. Yeah, so, okay, with that, it sums up my presentation. Yep, thank you.